Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So let me go back to my screen that, or my slide that explains what this is. Here I'm going to talk about the Stackelberg oligopoly. So if you haven't already, it might be useful to watch the Corno oligopoly video first. Uh, but, you know, why not? You're already here. So let's talk about Stackelberg. Stackelberg is like Corno, only here we're going to be dealing with sequential timing. So we have a situation where we have a leader follower structure. Right? So we have one firm going first, that's our leader, and then we have our follower who is going to observe what the leader has done and then make their own selection. And otherwise, for all purposes, it's going to be Corneau. So let me first show you the general situation, then I'm going to go really quickly to a numerical example because I didn't feel like working through the general Stackelberg for obvious reasons. So here is an inverse demand that I'll assume we have for our face facing that our duopolists are going to face. So price is equal to A minus Q1 minus Q2, marginal cost of C. This is just saying the vertical intercept is A. Firm 1 is bringing a quantity of Q1. Firm 2 is bringing a quantity of Q2. The larger the quantity Q1 brings, the less is left over for Q2 to bring because A is going to be the largest that the market will bear. And so if Q2 and Q1 sum up to something larger than A, right? then the price would be negative, which is, so that's bad. Okay, so let's write down firm one's profit function as, as a f profit as a function of their selection of their quantity. So A minus Q1 minus Q2 times Q1 minus CQ1. So this would be the core no profit function. Except we got a problem because I said with Stackelberg, we're doing sequential timing, meaning that firm one is going to move, firm two is going to choose, having seen what firm one has done. So technically, getting into the, the, the game theory behind the scenes, firm, one, firm two's choice is actually going to, firm two's strategy is actually going to be a function. It's going to be their best response function. And so we're going to have to put that into this, into our profit statement. Now, the reason why conceptually is because, well, firm two is not choosing their quantity arbitrarily, they're choosing their quantity now knowing what firm one has chosen. And they now know like how much this market is going to bear. And so this is what firm one does is going to strongly influence how firm two reacts. So we need firm two's reaction function to enter into firm one's profit. Why? Well, if we can figure this out, firm one can figure this out as well, right? The leader is going to figure out that the follower is going to see what the leader has done and then re react to it. And so I'm going to write down firm one's profit as a function of Q uh, of its choice Q1. And then when I get to the Q2 part, rather than just putting in Q2, I'm going to put in Q2 as a function of Q1. And this ought to look familiar now. This notation ought to look familiar if you've done the Corneau, because you realize, oh, this is firm two's reaction. This is firm two's reaction to firm one. This looks like Q2 times Q1. No, no, no. This is not, this is not multiplication. This is firm two's choice of Q2 as a function, this is function notation, function of Q1. All right, so this is actually a statement where only Q1s appear. So when you, when you fill this out, there's going to be no Q2s. Before you take the derivative with respect to Q1, this is going to be profit written only in terms of Q1, which actually kind of simplifies the analysis once you get over this conceptual hurdle. So this is our Stackelberg profit function. Anyway, so let's go ahead and do that. So because firm two's reaction to firm one's choice is Q2 of Q1 equals A minus Q1 minus C over two. If you remember from the Corneau, from the general Corneau reaction curves, we can just drop in this expression, this function, rather than Q2 in firm one's profit statement. Right, so I have A minus Q1 minus the quantity A minus Q1 minus C whole thing over two times Q1, which is firm one's choice minus its costs. Okay, but this is going to get complicated really quick, and uh, so I encourage you to work through that on your own. However, let's just do a numerical example. So let's assume that the inverse demand that we're going to face is price is equal to 15 minus Q1 minus Q2 with marginal cost of 3. Great. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do Corneau first to generate firm 2's reaction to firm 1's choice. So this isn't Stackelberg yet. Remember, when I do Stackelberg, I'm going to write the leader's profit function and 
the follower's choice has to enter as a function into the leader's profit. So firm two's choice has to enter as a function into firm one's profit decision, profit maximization problem. Well, in order to make that happen, we have to figure out what is going to be firm two's profit or best response function. So let's generate that here by doing Cournot. So here is Q2 of Q1. And that is actually a mistake. This should be Q2 of, this should be pi two of Q2, right? This is firm two's profit. I'm not, I'm not writing this as a function of Q1. I'm making this a function of Q2. So kind of wish I could fix that, but I can't. So this is, let's just say Q, this is pi two, right? So this is, I'm going to just cover this up because this is, this is bothering me. So probably bothering you too, especially now that I called attention to it. So we have 15 minus Q1 minus Q2 times Q2 minus 3Q2, right? This is firm two's profit function. We're going to clean up some algebra here. So I'm going to get 15Q2 minus Q1, Q2 minus Q2 squared minus 3Q2 or 12Q2 minus Q1, Q2 minus Q2 squared. Now I'm going to take the partial, take the derivative with respect to Q2, and I'm going to solve for the optimal Q2. When I do this, this is going to give me firm two's reaction function, firm two's best response to firm one's choice. Sure enough, if we do this, uh, we have what Q2 is equal to 6 minus 1 half Q1. And we can write this as Q2 as a function of Q1, right? This is going to give us firm two's choice as a function of firm one's selection. Right, this is firm two's reaction to firm one's Q1, right? Great, now this is precisely what we are gonna drop into firm one's profit maximization problem, right? So I've got pi, pi one of Q1. This is firm one's profit maximization problem where they are choosing their optimal quantity, knowing that firm two is gonna react, right? So here is, here is firm one's profit function, profit maximization problem with firm two's reaction function built into it. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to rewrite that same thing right here. So we've got room to work the problem. And I'm going to clean up a little bit of algebra. And as you do this, you realize, wow, this thing that starts off looking pretty messy, all of a sudden simplifies down to something really not bad at all. So we could take this derivative, right? 6Q1 six minus, six minus 1 half Q1 squared. Super easy. 6 minus Q1, right? Because 2 times 1 half is... Uh, is uh, just a 1q1, right? So 6q1, which tells us what's firm one's choice, a quantity of 6. Wonderful. So what's firm 2 going to do? Well, conveniently, we already have firm 2's problem solved, right? We have firm 2's reaction already. So I'm going to take q2 as a function of 6, and I'm going to find, oh, firm 2 is going to bring a quantity of 3 to the market. So here's what's happening. Firm one comes to the market, brings a quantity of six. Firm two observes this and optimally brings in a quantity of three. So what's the price gonna be? 15 minus six minus three or six. And if I compute our profits, price minus marginal cost times quantity. So I get six minus three times six is 18. So firm one's profits, the leader's profits are 18. The follower's profits are nine. Our joint industry profits are 27, right? 18 plus 9 is 27. So jointly, firm, the leader and the follower, firm 1 and firm 2, make profits of 27. Okay, so it's interesting, though. Let's compare this to a monopoly situation. So, so the monopoly would be like the leader moves and the follower just gives up. Right? That's not going to happen, but let's just compare to the compare to the monopoly situation. Okay, so the monopoly is going to face inverse demand of 15 minus Q. Price is equal to 15 minus Q. Same marginal cost of 3. Well, if inverse demand is price is equal to 15 minus Q, then marginal revenue is 15 minus 2Q. So 15 minus 2Q is equal to 3. MR equals MC. Solving, we get a quantity of 6. Oh, look, the monopoly would set a quantity of 6. Our stack of Berg leaders sets a quantity of 6. Difference is the Stackelberg leader has this follower that's going to now set a quantity of three and drive the price down to uh, to six, whereas the monopoly doesn't have a follower to worry about, and their price is going to stay up at nine. Okay, so the, what are the monopoly profits? Well, the monopoly profits price minus marginal cost times quantity is thirty six. So the monopoly profits would be thirty six. The Stackelberg industry profits are twenty seven. 
the Stackelberg leader gets profits of 18, the Stackelberg follower gets profits of 9. So then one question you might have is, well, how would this compare to Cournot? Well, we can solve the Cournot problem really straightforwardly because we already have the, we already have the reaction curves, right? It's a symmetric problem. So we had our followers reaction curve, which was 6 minus 1 half Q2 is, is uh, or, well, the followers reaction curve was Q2 as a function of Q1. So 6 minus 1 half Q1. By symmetry, our leaders, well, our firm one in the Cournot situations reaction curve would be Q1 as a function of Q2 is 6 minus 1 half Q2. And you could just run through the Cournot problem, right? So I showed you this. This would be our, whoops, uh, whoops. This would be our Cournot profit maximization problem, right? So you could do, you could write this out with the numerical values we have. This 15 minus Q1 minus Q2 and marginal cost of three. And if you do that, you will get these reaction curves. So I just skipped that step because I didn't feel like bothering. So we'll solve our system of reaction curves. And if we do this, we find, oh, so to do this, right, this is just solving by substitution. So I'm going to write Q1. I'm going to write, I'm going to write uh, my equation just as a function of Q1 by replacing Q2 of Q1 with 6 minus 1 half Q1. Solving, right, I get, I get uh, firm 1's optimal choice under Cournot, which is 4. And then by symmetry, we know firm 2's optimal choice is going to be 4 as well. We could verify this. Let's use our reaction curve. Let's take this 4, plug it in here, right? 1 half times 4 is 2. 6 minus 2 is 4. Cool. So our Cournot firms would each set a quantity of 4. This would give us a price of 7, right? 15 minus 8. And this would give us Cournot profits of 16 for each firm, or jointly, Cournot profits of 32. So this is really interesting, right? Because look at look at this in comparison to Stackelberg. So Stackelberg leader would get profits of 18, which is better than playing Cournot. And the Stackelberg follower gets profits of 9, which is worse than playing Cournot. The monopolist would get profits of 36, which is higher than the industry profits, the joint profits from Cournot, 16 plus 16 is 32, and higher than the 27 that our Stackelberg industry would get. Right, so the, at the industry level, profits are higher, highest as a monopoly. That should be unsurprising. Then followed by Cournot, then followed by, uh, then followed by Stackelberg. Right. However, if you are in the situation where you're the leader, you would rather be a Stackelberg leader than uh, than a standard Cournot firm. What's going on here? Where our, our Cournot firms will set quantities of four. Our Stackelberg firm is going to set a quantity of six, our Stackelberg leaders sets a quantity of six, and the Stackelberg follower a quantity of three, right? So our Stackelberg leaders like a little bit greedy, right? They're going to be able to sort of they're going to they're going to they're going to take a larger share. Sorry, they're going to take a larger share of what the market will bear, and our Stackelberg follower has no other choice than to well, if they're optimizing, then to set a quantity of three. So interestingly, thinking about conceptually, what's going on here? Stackelberg has an interesting information property. Usually we think of more information as being better. We think of adding information being beneficial. We think of decision makers, think of like you think of situations of market failure caused by asymmetric information. As the information problems are overcome, as we're restoring information to the problem, we get closer to market efficiency and maybe it's better for um, maybe it's better for our market participants. In some cases, some cases not. Anyway, here it's a situation where more information is not better, right? Here, the leader exploits the fact that it knows the follower will have information about the leader's choice. The leader's going to move. The follower observes the leader's move. And the leader knows the follower observes the leader's move. Therefore, the leader's going to set the monopoly quantity. The follower sets less than the Cournot quantity. And what's happened? This extra information has hurt our Stackelberg follower. It's benefited our Stackelberg leader. So anyway, I think that's kind of cool.